What if more roads just made traffic worse? These cities proved it. Around the world, planners kept widening highways and adding lanes, but the jams never disappeared. In fact, in many places, the new roads filled up even faster than the old ones. But a few cities broke the cycle. Some leaned on high-speed trains, others redesigned neighborhoods, and a few even charged drivers to enter busy zones. Tokyo. When people think about fixing traffic, the first idea is usually to add more roads. Wider highways, new flyovers, and extra lanes are seen as the natural solution. But in many cases, more roads only brings more cars, which quickly fills up the new space. Some cities around the world have broken this cycle by not focusing on roads at all. Instead, they build transportation systems that moved huge numbers of people without relying on private cars. The clearest example is Tokyo. Tokyo is one of the largest and most crowded cities on the planet. More than 37 million people live in the greater metropolitan area. If everyone drove, the city would collapse under gridlock. But Tokyo avoided this by building something very different, one of the most advanced train networks in the world. The core of Tokyo's traffic solution is high-capacity rail. The city has multiple layers of train systems that work together, subways, private rail lines, and the famous Shinkansen bullet trains for longer distances. These trains are not just frequent, they run with extreme precision. During peak hours, trains can arrive every two to three minutes. Each train can carry hundreds to over a thousand passengers at once. This means that instead of more cars squeezing onto roads, tens of thousands of people move smoothly on trains. But Tokyo did more than just build trains. The city designed entire neighborhoods around train stations. These are sometimes called station cities. Instead of stations being just a stop along the way, they became the center of local life. Around many stations, you find shopping malls, restaurants, offices, and even apartments built directly into the complex. This design means that people can live, work, shop, and socialize all within walking distance of a station. This structure flips the normal logic of urban planning. In most car-heavy cities, people live far from where they work or shop, and roads are needed to connect everything. In Tokyo, the station is the anchor, and everything grows around it. This reduces the need for cars, because so many daily needs can be reached on foot or by train. The results are striking. Despite Tokyo's massive population, the car ownership rate per household is much lower than in cities like Los Angeles or Houston. Traffic still exists, but it's not the defining feature of the city. Trains handle the bulk of movement, and roads are used more for logistics, taxis, and short trips rather than daily commutes. But not every place can build a rail system as massive as Tokyo's. Amsterdam. Some cities looked at the same traffic problem and chose a completely different answer. Amsterdam is one of the clearest examples, and its solution was built on bikes and walking, not on cars. At first, this sounds unrealistic. How could a modern city of almost a million people in the core and over 2.5 million in the region depend so heavily on bicycles? For many people, bikes are a childhood activity, a weekend hobby, or something done in parks. But in Amsterdam, the bicycle is not a hobby. It's the main way people move around the city. More than 60% of all trips inside the city are made by bike. That's not a side option, that's the default. The reason this works is because Amsterdam redesigned its streets around people, not vehicles. Starting in the 1970s, the city made a sharp choice. Instead of widening roads, it began narrowing them. Space once used for cars was given to protected bike lanes and pedestrian areas. Today, you'll find intersections where bikes get their own signals separated from cars. You'll find entire downtown zones where cars are either heavily restricted or banned. Instead of fighting traffic with more asphalt, Amsterdam removed the need for cars on many trips. This change did more than just cut congestion, it made travel times more predictable. If you bike in Amsterdam, your commute is not affected by traffic jams, fuel prices, or parking struggles. A trip that takes 15 minutes today will still take 15 minutes next week. That kind of consistency is one of the hidden strengths of a bike-first city. Another key point is how safe and accessible Amsterdam made this system. Bike lanes are wide, physically separated, and connected like a real network. Pedestrian areas are designed so walking is natural and direct, not an afterthought. Even people who don't cycle benefit because the overall environment is cleaner, calmer, and less dominated by cars. The numbers show how powerful this choice has been. Despite being a dense European capital, Amsterdam does not suffer the gridlock seen in many car-first cities. Car ownership is lower than average, and many households get by without one. Instead of traffic defining daily life, cycling and walking feel normal, efficient, and reliable. The counterintuitive lesson here is simple. Amsterdam solved traffic by giving less space to cars, not more. It shrank roads and gave the space back to people, and in doing so, it made the city easier to move through, not harder. Together with Tokyo's rail-driven model, Amsterdam's bike-first approach shows there isn't only one way to escape endless traffic. 
Different cities can choose solutions that fit their size, history, and culture. Next, we will look at another example, one that focused on buses and rapid transit instead of either bikes or trains. London. Amsterdam showed that a city can reduce traffic by shrinking road space and giving priority to bikes and pedestrians. But what about a city that doesn't have space to rebuild its streets so drastically, or a culture already tied to cars? London faced this problem in the early 2000s, and it decided on a very different approach. It made driving in the most crowded areas expensive. This was not about adding more trains or bike lanes, though London does have those. The core solution was what is now called congestion pricing. The idea is simple. If too many cars are trying to enter the same part of the city, charge drivers for that access. That way, only the people who really need to drive will pay for it, while others will switch to buses, trains, or bikes. When the plan was first announced in 2003, many people thought it would never work. Londoners were used to driving through the central city without paying. Businesses worried they would lose customers, and drivers felt it was unfair. But once the system started, the results were immediate. Traffic in central London dropped by about 15% in the first year. Buses ran more reliably because they weren't stuck in jams. Pollution levels fell. People who had alternatives began using them, and the people who continued to drive were mostly those who valued the trip enough to pay. What makes London's case interesting is how it shows that traffic isn't only a design problem, it's also an economic problem. Roads have limited space, but they're usually free to use. This creates a mismatch. Demand grows endlessly, while supply cannot. Congestion pricing corrects that imbalance by putting a cost on driving in the busiest zones, much like a ticket price balances supply and demand for a concert or a plane seat. The system's also flexible. London adjusts the fee depending on time and location. The goal is not to ban cars, but to manage them so roads don't collapse under pressure. At the same time, the money collected from these fees doesn't vanish. It's reinvested into public transport, bike infrastructure, and better streets. In effect, drivers who chose to use the roads are funding the alternatives for those who don't. Two decades later, congestion pricing has become a normal part of London life. The policy has been expanded and copied by other cities around the world, including Singapore, Stockholm, and New York. The biggest lesson from London is that solving traffic doesn't always require building new infrastructure. Sometimes the fastest way to free up space is to use prices to manage demand. Barcelona London showed how a city can use pricing to manage who drives, but what if the goal is not to just reduce cars, but reshaping entire neighborhoods so cars no longer dominate them at all? Barcelona took this question seriously and built one of the boldest experiments in urban traffic design, the superblock. At first glance, a superblock looks like an ordinary neighborhood grid, but the difference is in how cars are allowed to move inside it. Normally, city streets are open to through traffic. Drivers cut across neighborhoods to save time. In a superblock, that shortcut is blocked. Cars can enter to reach homes, shops, or deliveries, but they cannot drive straight through. Streets inside the superblock are turned into local-only roads with very low speed limits, often just 10 km per hour. The through traffic is pushed to the larger perimeter roads that surround the block. This simple change flips how space is used. Streets that once carried constant streams of cars become quiet open areas where people can walk, cycle, and gather. Children play outside, small businesses expand their seating into the street, and the noise of engines is replaced by actual community life. By cutting off the shortcut, the city eliminated a large amount of unnecessary driving while keeping essential access intact. The results in Barcelona have been dramatic. Air pollution inside superblocks dropped. Traffic accidents went down. Noise levels fell, making the neighborhoods more livable. People started using bikes and walking more because it felt safer and more direct than before. Even though drivers worried at first that the perimeter roads would become overloaded, studies have shown that overall traffic in the city actually decreased as more trips shifted away from cars entirely. What makes Barcelona's strategy so interesting is how counterintuitive it is. Most people think that if you restrict cars on certain streets, traffic must get worse elsewhere, but the evidence shows the opposite. When through traffic is removed, many drivers simply stop making unnecessary car trips and switch to other modes. In other words, some of the traffic wasn't needed in the first place. Another key detail is scale. A single superblock is powerful, but Barcelona didn't stop there. The plan was designed as a network, multiple superblocks connected across the city. The more superblocks are added, the more the city shifts away from a car grid to a people grid. It's not about banning cars entirely, it's about reorganizing the system so cars are guests, not rulers, in the urban core. Barcelona's superblocks proves that cities don't need new highways to free up space, they can do the opposite. Cut out through traffic, reclaim local streets, and still keep mobility functioning. It's a solution that combines design with simplicity. No massive infrastructure, no complicated technology,
just a smarter way to organize movement. So far, we've seen trains in Tokyo, bikes in Amsterdam, pricing in London, and redesign in Barcelona, but the story doesn't end here. Paris. Even though Barcelona showed how blocking through traffic inside neighborhoods can transform daily life, Paris approached the same problem from another angle. Instead of just reorganizing existing grids, the French capital chose to directly take road space away from cars and give it back to people. For decades, Paris was known for heavy car traffic. Wide boulevards built in the 19th century had become clogged with vehicles in the 20th. By the 90s and early 2000s, congestion and pollution were part of daily life. But instead of adding more roads or building elevated highways, the city went in the opposite direction. Leaders started closing lanes to cars and turning them into plazas, bike paths, and pedestrian promenades. One of the most famous examples is along the River Seine. A major roadway once ran along the riverbanks, carrying cars through the city. Paris closed large sections of it, converting the space into public walkways, green areas, and cultural venues. What used to be noisy traffic corridors became places for people to stroll, cycle, and gather. This wasn't a small side project, it was a major shift in how the city valued its prime land. One of the most famous avenues in the world is also being redesigned. Instead of eight lanes of traffic, the plan reduces car lanes and expands tree-lined pedestrian zones. The idea is simple but powerful. These central spaces are more valuable as public destinations than as car corridors. The counterintuitive part is that cutting road lanes did not cause total gridlock. In fact, research shows that when road capacity is reduced in central Paris, overall car traffic drops across the city. This is because many trips that depended on those lanes were not essential. People switched to the metro, to buses, to bikes, or simply walked instead. Just like in Barcelona, some of the traffic disappeared once the shortcut option was removed. At the same time, Paris invested heavily in alternatives. The Veli bike sharing system, one of the first large-scale programs of its kind, gave people access to thousands of bikes spread across the city. Metro and bus systems were expanded and improved. Public plazas created new spaces where people could sit, shop, and meet, which made walking more attractive. Together, these changes created a feedback loop. Fewer cars made the streets calmer, and calmer streets made it easier for even more people to give up driving. Paris's transformation shows that reducing car lanes is not about punishing drivers. It's about reallocating scarce space to uses that benefit more people. A single car lane might carry a few hundred vehicles per hour, but the same space as a plaza or bike corridor can serve thousands of people moving, relaxing, or shopping. By shrinking road space and adding plazas, Paris broke the cycle of car dominance without adding new roads. It's another proof that cities can solve traffic by changing priorities instead of pouring concrete. Bogota. Paris proved that even the most car-heavy boulevards can be turned back into spaces for people, but not every city has the money to redesign landmarks or build new metros, and that's where Bogota, Colombia comes in. With limited resources, the city still managed to reduce car dependence by inventing a system that moves millions every day. Bus Rapid Transit, known locally as Transmilenio. On the surface, buses might not sound revolutionary. They're usually slow, stuck in the same jams as cars. Bogota turned that logic on its head. Instead of treating buses like a second-class transport, the city redesigned streets so buses had priority. Transmilenio buses run on exclusive lanes carved out of existing roads. Cars cannot use these lanes. At key points, Buses stop at raised platforms that look and work like metro stations with prepaid ticketing and multiple doors for fast boarding. The effect is a bus system that feels closer to a subway in terms of speed and capacity without the cost of digging tunnels. This design carries an enormous number of people. On a typical day, Transmillennial moves over 2 million passengers. That's more than many rail systems in wealthier countries. Because buses come every few minutes, passengers don't need to rely on private cars for predictable travel times. For a fraction of the cost of a metro, Bogota built a system that could keep up with its rapid population growth. But Bogota didn't stop at buses. The city also experimented with a bold social idea, regular car-free days, known as ciclovia. Every Sunday and on certain holidays, more than 100 kilometers of streets are closed to cars and open to cyclists, runners, and pedestrians. On these days, Bogota transforms from a traffic-heavy capital into a massive open-air park. Millions of residents take part, proving that the city's roads can serve people directly, not just vehicles. This combination sent a powerful message. Roads are not automatically for cars. They're public space, and cities can decide how to use them. That shift in thinking has influenced cities around the world. Systems inspired by Bogota's model now exist in Mexico City, Guangzhou, Jakarta, and dozens of other places. The counterintuitive lesson here is clear. 
You don't need high-speed trains or billion-dollar subways to beat traffic. Sometimes giving buses their own space and proving that streets belong to everyone is enough to change behavior at scale. Bogota managed to create mobility for the masses while showing that car dominance is not inevitable, even in a growing and resource-limited city. Above all, more lanes don't solve traffic. Every city uses a different tool, but the lesson is the same. Traffic is not an engineering problem that can be fixed with asphalt. It's a design problem about how we choose to move people. Roads will always have limits, but cities that think beyond roads show us that movement doesn't have to stop with congestion. The real solution is not bigger highways, it's smarter choices.